Uh, hello everybody, my name is Jo, welcome to our session talk. Uh, we have over 200 guests registering for this event from 29 countries um, uh, this, this day. The subject is Sites of Labour, Silicon Valley Workplace in Counterpoint to Home-Based Work. Uh, before I introduce you to our esteemed speakers, Claudia and Francis, I'd like to cover uh, a few housekeeping items. First, today's webinar is being recorded. We will share the recording on our event page at some point next week. Uh, please feel free to use the chat button if you have any technical difficulties regarding the webinar. And we also invite you to ask questions by using the Q&A button. You can upvote questions if you like. Uh, and any remaining unanswered questions we might have at the end of the session, we will try to get our speakers to answer at a later stage and make their answers available or on the page. Please join me in welcoming Claudia and Francis. I'm going to hand you over to Claudia, who is going to start today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, welcome to all of you joining us from around the world for this afternoon discussion, Sites of Labour, Silicon Valley Workplace in Counterpoint to Home-Based Work. It's my real pleasure to welcome Dr. Francis Hollis, Architect, Emeritus Reader in Architecture at London Metropolitan University and Director of the Work Home Project. Francis is an international expert on the architecture of home-based work. And while the rest of us have suddenly switched tack to participate in this global experiment, um, in home working during COVID-19. This has actually been Frances's topic of specialism and research for over 15 years. She brings her extensive knowledge of the history, promises and politics and provocations of labour cited in the home. In 2009, she received funding from the AHRC to develop her project, The Work Home, um, into, and it's a website that provides historical precedents of home-based work, design guides and a pattern book as well as her work on policy and governance, which can be found at theworkhome.com. And I really encourage you to go and have a look at it. Frances is working on a global call at the moment to people who are interested in how home-based work impacts on buildings and cities and their laws and regulations. And she's asking people to collaborate and contribute to facilitating home-based work. Her work is grounded in questions of equitability with a further AHRC supported exploration towards the affordable work home, a community-based initiative with home-based workers in social housing. And her publications include Beyond Live Work, The Architecture of Home-Based Work, and the Dutch journal Dash 15, Homework City, um, with Irene Schroes and Paul Coutenborough, where she considers home-based work at both the scale of the individual dwelling and the scale of the urban block. So, um, Speculations on what it means to work from home pro proliferate. There have been declarations on the end of the office, the death of the office, the end of the central business district, the arrival of home-based office, the home office revolution, and many op-eds about the purgatory of lockdown work, and that home-based home work is contributing to us having less or more healthy lives, or that it's levelling the playing field. Their grand claims, however, we're very lucky to have today with us an expert on the architecture of home-based work, and together we'll present and discuss ideas in a conversation structured in three parts, going to work, being at work, and leaving work from our contrasting perspectives. I'll be drawing on my research in the Silicon Valley campus to query the idealization of the workplace as a site where you not only carry out work duties, but also find meaning, value, belonging, and um, work that you uh, define your personal identity through. In counterpoint to the, to the provocations from Francis and home-based working, we'll tease out the distinction between working at home and living at the workplace and explore the impact of COVID-19 on the sites of labour and implications on architecture and the city. So I'd like to start by... Um, sort of asking Francis to explain a little bit about the historical context um, of going to work. And when did we start going to work um, as a place separate from our homes? Hi, Claudia. Thanks so much for inviting me. So when did we start working? When did we start going out to work? Um, 
before the industrial revolution um almost everybody worked from home um uh it was completely normal either working in their homes or living at their workplaces um and this uh this continued for a very long time and then with the invention of the factory and the city as a as an, a financial institution um a need arose for people to gather in collective workplaces in order to carry out their work and so people started to go out to work um but through this period and the, the received wisdom is that everyone went out to work at that point but actually in reality a great many people in a wide range of different occupations carried on um working in their homes or living at their workplaces um from school keeper to landlord baker to tailor umbrella repairer to bicycle maker and hair cutter to flower seller so working at home or living at the workplace was completely normal however by the end of the 19th century there was really widespread disapproval of home based work the um employers didn't like it because it reduced the amount of control they had over their employees the unions didn't like it because they had a concern about um uh, what they felt was a an unregulated and vulnerable workforce but also because they felt it undermined their campaign for a male family wage um the social reformers didn't like it because when they went into the slums of the east end of london they found appalling conditions and they elided the issue of home based work with the terrible problems of overcrowding and poor sanitation and finally um last but not least maybe most importantly um there was very widespread public opinion conservative with a small c public opinion that a woman's place was in the home um and domestic and not uh and not income generating and so when the when the slums of the east end were knocked down and the housing that was uh, built to replace them was specifically designed to prevent home based work and it was um it was governed through tenancy agreements that prohibited it because at the time there was this division between what they thought of as the the deserving poor and the undeserving poor and the deserving poor were the ones who got the housing and in order to be uh to be part of that category you there needed to be a family member who was going out to work who had a job so um so the result of this was a sort of the development of a culture in which there was a male family wage earner who went out to work and and uh, a a woman who stayed at home looking after children and being domestic so i suppose that's where it started it's it's really amazing to really question this because we just accept it as normal we go out to work and then there's some people who don't go out to work and i'm just kind of thinking about you know in today's context and it might seem like an overly simple question but why do we go to work nowadays i don't think it is a simple question i think it's a really interesting question um obviously the the simplistic answer is that we go out to work to earn our livings to carry out our paid employment but what the interesting thing that um covid-19 has shown us is that actually a great many of us don't need to go out to work in order to earn our livings we can do it from home so the question is why do we go out from work and i think one of the reasons is that our that a great many employers haven't actually trusted their employees to work productively there's always been this you know working at home shirking at home uh the the idea that you 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 work you work from home and actually you're having a day off watching daytime television and um and i think that's been blown out of the water with with the covid experiment but i think that's one of the reasons we've gone out for work but i think there are many reasons why people actually like to go out to work so um we're social creatures so work, the workplace is often a very sociable place um we meet people we make friends with our colleagues um we fall in love we we meet our partners um all these sorts of reasons um um you know because at the moment you know we don't need to go out to work so but and we haven't done for quite a long time so and there are other many other reasons i think um 
I think uh, quite a lot of people go out to work in order to get away from their domestic situations, to get away from um, maybe from childcare responsibilities or maybe from partners that they really can't stand or um, uh, these sorts of things. So, so going out to work can be an escape from a, a, a less than ideal domestic situation. Um, it gets us out and about. So we get exercise, we see the world, we move through the world. That's another reason for going out to work. And then what, what's just emerging at the moment, which I find completely fascinating, is that our economy is largely uh, consumption based. So actually, we go out to work in order to drive the economy. So we go out to work and we pay extortionate amount of money on um, transport to get ourselves to work. We buy um, lots of clothes, so we're not wearing the same clothes every day at work. We buy coffee on our way, maybe at lunchtime and in the evening as well. We buy lunch. Um, and that is actually kicking the economy around. So that's a really interesting one that's 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 interesting challenge that's facing us at the moment. Because what happens is what what is happening is that um we're not doing that. So I think lots of people people who have some money are actually saving a fortune at the moment because they're not they're not engaging in all those forms of consumption. There's a, quite a lot at stake at the moment um if we'd stop going out to work. Um, and we, we can see quite a few um, articles about the death of the central business district, which I think connects to what you just said about driving other parts of the economy. Um, and I wonder, though, when people talk about the Home Office revolution, given all of that complexity at stake, um, is it possible that we're going to see a significant switch to home based work that will outlast the COVID-19 crisis? I think so. So I think the answer to that is a fairly resounding yes. Um, the, the, the research that's, that's coming out shows that, um, I don't think I've yet to see, to see a survey and there are lots of surveys being done at the moment that shows that most people aren't finding it's, it's improving their quality of life and, um, that they want to carry on doing it afterwards uh, for either one day a week or even up to five days a week people are finding that they're healthier they're happier they're less stressed they're sleeping better they're taking exercise by walking their dog rather than going to the gym they're uh, really happy to be seeing more of their families spending you know i mean i saw one survey of people saying they were so enjoying having lunch with their family every day um and so um i think this is really really interesting and i mean i saw a, a survey of um 26,000 um, millennials um, by Deloitte. And this really surprised me because even the millennials, I think 62% said that they felt that it was reducing stress in their lives and they would like to carry on doing it if they could after COVID is over. And of course, it's not just employees who are enjoying it. For employers, I think the real, um, the really big surprise has been that their employees are, most employees are more productive, not less. Um, and also they suddenly realise that that their firms can be run from people's homes. I think the, uh, there's a lovely quote from the chief executive of Barclays that has 70,000 employees across the world, including 7,000 in a glitzy headquarters in Canary Wharf in London. And um, he said... He's really not sure he needs his headquarter building anymore because his employers are, are running the business very effectively from their kitchens. The direct quote, which I think is really, really nice. So let's see what happens. But it certainly looks set to um, to continue. Quite interesting because the view from Facebook and Google um, was that the transition to home based working was actually a lot smoother than they anticipated. And that certainly in the short term, it's working very well. And I think what's been interesting, though, is what they're bringing up about more longer term issues. So they're Google, for example, are wondering what happens when their teams start to change over. So a lot of it's sort of facilitated because the teams knew each other very well offline. Um, and then they were able to continue those relationships um, in, a, in a sort of offsite 
way using Zoom and other kind of technologies. Um, and so they're really questioning, well, what happens in six months time when there's new team members? Um, will it work quite as well? Is there going to be a drop off of how how well it's working for them? I think it's a really interesting question. And the answer is we don't know. And and we have to we're going to be watching very closely to see what's happening. Um, and I think integrating new people is uh, really I mean, I've no idea. Um, because I think I think it's completely valid point that most teams are existing and they sort of go into it with a sort of uh, with a collective spirit of um, making this work and they're used to they know how to work with each other. But I think there is evidence starting to emerge that people who are new in jobs that have never ever been to the office where they're meant to be working um, in some ways are finding this an easier way in to a new job because they're in their comfortable well obviously and everything I say has to be uh yeah you, the, there's a caveat because one's experience our experience of enforced home-based work as a result of COVID is entirely dependent on our home situation and uh, that that can't be stressed enough but for people who have got enough space um and you know they've got a stable internet and they've they've got what they need to be able to do it um i think it is there is evidence that it's making their lives easier in a new job because they feel more comfortable and they feel more able to be themselves and also that they that the people they're working with they're able to see something of their domestic environment and therefore um they have more of an idea of who they are. So I think that's quite interesting. I don't know what's going to happen about informal office hierarchies. Um, I think that those are things that the, those are those are whole things that are played out in the office. And I don't know quite how that's going to work out if people are interacting through Zoom. There is there's a discussion about whether it's going to flatten hierarchies, but I really don't know. I think that. Uh, it may be a situation, I suspect what we're going to end up with is a blending, a blended situation where um, people work partly from home and partly in the office. But there may be a population of people for whom it's really not feasible to work from home. People who have either very small or very overcrowded homes. Um, and so then I don't know quite what the dynamic will be in offices if the office population is made up entirely of such people. Um, I don't know. I mean, we may end up with the situation where the days in where where you have employees who come in for for meetings or for bouncing ideas off each other and they're happier and healthier and they're really excited to see each other. And these days are wonderful. It, it's really all all up in the air, I think. But my personal experience is that I am I find very surprisingly that I'm getting to know people that I didn't know before COVID purely over Zoom. And I feel as if I'm getting to know them really well. And so we'll see, I think. It's a very interesting question. So I think embedded in what you just said, I think is something really, really interesting, which is about um, who will go to work and perhaps a new demographic emerging. And um, Facebook have said that um, maybe half of their workforce might work from home permanently. And I think it's kind of worth interrogating that statement because it actually sounds really dramatic as if they'll suddenly abandon their new campus buildings. Um, and certainly when Facebook, Apple and Google make these kind of announcements, they're seen as the forefront of um, workplace management protocols. Um, and I think that leads to speculation on the death of the workplace. But I think what's really interesting to ask is, um, is whether the workplace will become the site of a very particular type of labor. So in Silicon Valley at the moment, presently half of Facebook's global workforce are based there. Um, but they massively expanded their workforce after the um, Cambridge Analytica and Russian election scandals. And they expanded their workforce to include people that they hadn't normally recruited before, a lot of non-engineers. So people that worked in areas such as content review and child safety, hate speech monitoring, um, legal specialists and so on. 
And though for those teams, it's perhaps less important that they're in the Silicon Valley ecology, you know, that proximity to all the software engineers. And Twitter, con in, in contrast, announced that their employees could work from home forever. And they're, they're very much a sort of online only company. Apple, um, some of their hardware teams already started returning back to the workplace in early May. Um, and you see sort of a difference between the companies and the kind of management that they have. You know, Apple, for example, have notorious secrecy protocols. It's very, very complex to take hardware off site. And they were having to negotiate quite difficult reinterpretations of those protocols when um, something was taken into someone's home. Um, so I think there's a really nuanced picture emerging that's neither the death of the office totally, but a sort of question about the reconfiguration of these sites of labor and who's including who's included in the physical um, workspace and who who's better to be uh, more remote yep i think that's i think that just about sums it up and i think that nuance is good and i think that's where we're likely to be headed um i think that potentially um this whole expansion ac accepting losing the Home-based work losing its stigma, losing the sense of the lack of trust, so that it becomes a real, a real option, even in the big tech companies, which is extraordinary sort of shift in their policies. But I'm quite sure that different companies will have different approaches. But I suspect that home-based work will be part of each company's sort of portfolio package of what they offer. I mean, I think, I think you know. It, 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 one size really doesn't fit all. And I think each particular company will have its own approach. And I think that potentially it opens up um, real, really interesting um, scope for increasing the diversity of the, 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 the people who are employed by each company. And I, I heard, I, I saw an article by um, Mark Zuckerberg saying that um, what he felt was that um, once he'd realized that people could work from home is that it meant he could cast his net much wider because at the moment he could only employ people who were prepared to, to move to Silicon Valley. And I think that, you know, there are brilliant engineers all over the world who aren't prepared to go and work 14 hours a day in Silicon Valley. And you can imagine the um, brilliant Icelandic engineer who might have a child even shock horror and she might she might decide that she really wants to work for facebook but there's no way she's going to go to um silicon valley and and that might be a really wonderful outcome so so i think it's very exciting i think that that barriers are are dropping actually I need to kind of shift the discussion a bit more to being at work um, and ask you to perhaps cover a few definitions because we say working from home and home working and I'm wondering, you know, are there specific definitions? Are we taught, is it all the same thing? Um, this is such an interesting question. When I started my research, um, I thought I was, I was, uh, I was researching live work, which is an architectural movement. And I soon realized I wasn't. I was researching something very much bigger. Um, and so I started to look at the sociological research of home-based work. And I think I found something like 15 or 20 different definitions because sociologists tend to study very distinct portions of the home-based workforce so for example a home worker has overtones of um, a, 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 an underprivileged peace worker um, and and the way that the government counts home-based workers they call them it, they call it working from home that only includes people who actually work in their house or in their flat um, whereas actually because I'm an architect and I'm interested in the space and the buildings and, and the urbanism of home-based work, I decided I needed a, a definition as broad as possible. So for me, home-based work covers anyone who lives at their workplace, who uh, works in their home or works in a building adjacent to their home or who uses their home as a base. So for example, the plumber 
who has a home office to do his paperwork and also has storage for materials and tools. So, so mine is a very broad, and I think that's the most useful definition when we're thinking about the built environment. That's great. I think at this point, now we've thrown some of those definitions out there and we've covered a few um, concepts. It would be great to launch the poll. We have a few questions for our audience to answer, um, which sort of are trying to get a picture of what everybody feels about working from home. And um, they're just coming up on screen. So we're asking you to just respond to three questions and um, it will help sort of give us a picture of where what's happening for you. And I think it's worth mentioning that these same questions have been asked by Frances in a, in a different demographic. So it's going to be very, very fascinating for her to see how they compare. Great, we're seeing, seeing some responses come in. So interesting. <laughs> Very good. Yes, I've, um, these are, these are questions that are taken from a poll done by, um, an organization called Europe, Europe Ignites and Unispace for, of 620 asset managers. And I then asked them of, uh, the audience of a webinar I was giving in Chandigarh in North India. So it's going to be extremely interesting to see how, how the answers compare across the three the three demographics. Okay, I think we have, just give it five more seconds, so quickly make your vote and then I'll, I'll close it and launch the next. Right. So we have the results. Francis is that. And I think it is universal across every, and in fact, it, it, from my own personal research as well, the people that I've, um, I've, I've been involved with, having more control over our lives is, uh, is, is such a, a benefit. 1%, um, no, none. Um, so shall we ask the second question as well? Yeah, let's ask all three, yep. Two. Oh, share results. Oh, so the, hang on one second. The, I think the viewers couldn't see the oh, results. Oh, they couldn't see the results. Okay, there it's, are the results. I saw a message that we were. Hopefully you can see them now. Attendees are now reviewing. The I think the commute. Uh, there was a professor in America, um, Professor Layard, who did, uh, is known for his studies on happiness. And the daily commute to work is the most hated time. In, I think he studied a thousand uh, uh, middle-aged women and they hated their commute to work. Um, only a little bit more than they hated their work commute home from work. So this reinforces that as well. Good. Should we move to the next one? Oh, still can't see it. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so I'm going to ask Bethany to launch the second poll. Yeah. Okay, I'll see if I can do it. Okay, I think I've managed to launch the second poll. Biggest challenges, if people are seeing that. Maybe we should carry on the conversation, um, Claudia, well, I'm, I'm aware that time is, is moving on, so maybe we can... They're coming in now. The votes are coming in now. It is working. Okay. Biggest challenge is not enough spatial separation from family household. 
That's interesting. This is um this is very similar to Chandigarh. Okay, I think we'll give it five more seconds if you can make your votes. And we'll close the poll. Yeah, seems like it's in the poll. Show results. Okay. So we have, yes, one of the working longer hours than if I were commuting, not enough spatial separations, very high. Social isolation got a high high number of people talking about social isolation i wonder if that's just because of the also the context of lockdown because you can't actually go out and after work and uh, meet i mean you sort of can now but certainly during a lot of lockdown you couldn't then go and socialize with people you know you really were locked into your, to your no. house no I think that socialized, social isolation is known to be one of the really major disadvantages of home-based work. And it's one of the issues that if we designed our buildings and our neighborhoods differently, um, it could be a very different picture. Right. Okay. And then we have the final poll. Okay. Would you like to continue to work from home after the COVID-19 crisis is over? Wow, we had a sudden launch of, <laughs> of votes <laughs> on that one. A lot of people voting on this one. Okay, I'm going to end this poll in five seconds. So that's that's the results. Uh, majority three days a week, uh, quite a few, 20% four days a week, quarter, um, sorry, 16% five days a week. And somebody's pointed out that there's an assumption that, that everybody works already five days a week. Um, and one day a week, 2%. So. And Claudia, there is a comment saying that we should be carrying on the conversation while the poll is continued. And I do. I think that's right. So let's continue our conversation. Otherwise, they're just sitting there. So um, I think um, I saw quite a few kind of going back a bit to some of the definitions of work um, and thinking also about the, the amount of time that we spend at work when we're working in this new context. So I saw a few people comment that they weren't working from home, that they were living at work. And I actually quite like this definition because it also, ref it does refer to the bad practices of working from home, where the boundaries of your work and personal life are being completely transgressed, as well as the statement um, that has another meaning in the Silicon Valley context, which is actually um, very celebrated. You bring your whole self to work in a sense, it's so meaningful that work is where you are truly living and how you define your identity. And Silicon Valley and the way that they design their workplaces are very clever at enfolding this kind of personal meaning that you get from work, um, both within their, their mission, but also architecturally, they really try and manifest this sense that your work is very meaningful throughout the spaces. Um, and they also have this kind of philosophy that um, their work is to enable an employee to realize their full potential. And this is why you're very well fed in the campus. There's even on-site dentists and bike fixers and so on. And a lot of people think this is to trick you into working longer, but actually it's to, well, their, their idea is that it gets all of these kind of menial tasks out of the way so that you can realize your full potential by working amazingly because they kind of recognize that actually a lot of people are very motivated to work well. We're not sort of automatically shirking work. Um, but I think also living at work shows a bit more of a cynical side of the Silicon Valley lifestyle. Um, the last time Francis and I presented together, I showed an image of somebody who, who did live on campus. He lived in a transit van um, on one of the Google car parks. And he had this kind of ascetic life in his van. And then it was supplemented by all of the amenities on offer at Google. 
from free, free showers and meals and the sense of community. And he felt like he was living the dream. Um, but I think I'm also mindful when I say living of work that I'm also talking about, I'm really talking about those of us who are privileged to work at home comfortably, um, even if we do find our boundaries compromised. Um, and not, let's say, the vegetable pickers and um, packers currently in lockdown in shared mobile homes in Herefordshire or care workers who chose to live on site during the peak of the coronavirus or those workers on cruise ships and container ships who are unable to return to their home port and are living at sea long after their contract ends. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a kind of provocation of living at work. Yeah. I think that there, there are two responses to this. I don't think it's ever good for people to feel they can't get away from their home-based work, I think, or, or from their work at all. I think that people need to feel that they are able to retreat. Um, uh, and I, I, I think that the 14-hour the Silicon Valley days are, are very challenging. And the, 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 the narrative is that... that the, the the campus gives you everything you need but I think that leaves a lot of things out of the picture and in terms of home-based work I mean I think that I think people are struggling um lots of people are struggling because they feel that they can't get away from their work um but there are there's a whole nother sector of people who actually really who are usually invisible home-based workers who really like living at their workplace and these are the artists and the makers the the sculptors, the bakers, the, the brewers who choose to live. They need non-domestic spaces and they choose to live at their, at their workplace. And there, there's the other sector of the population who do this, who I call the backbone of the community, which are the, the publicans and the shopkeepers, the, the clergy, the, um, the used to be the police and the firefighters. It's reduced now, but it, it used to be a really significant factor in the neighborhood, these people who were living at their workplace and highly visible. I think actually that as a proposition prompts us to expand our notion of what working from home could possibly be. And I'm just sort of thinking of workers. Um, it's kind of, there was this construction of work as an activity um, and technology hasn't quite lived up to its promise to release us from 40 and 50 hour weeks or, or release us to pursue our own projects, pleasures, visions, you know, this kind of idea. Um, it's enabled us to work 14 hours and some of that work isn't very inspiring. And I wonder in this context with Zoom, everything is a meeting. Things that were very varied in the physical workplace, I think, are now sort of the, the meeting format. And I wonder what your your reflection is on this experiment and are, are employers really both making unreasonable demands on us or perhaps not even understanding the potential of what home based work could look like? I think I think we're in very early days and everyone's learning and I think employers are learning and I think there is some 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 bad practice going on and I think people are getting extremely zoomed out. The people who I think one of the things that happened when 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 COVID struck and people were suddenly in their homes was that managers got incredibly nervous and started imposing daily team meetings that were driving their teams mad. I think people are relaxing a bit now, but I think that the 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 issues that are raised by running all sorts of institutions um, remotely mean that meetings are necessary. And of course, what people can now do is have back-to-back -back meetings where they would previously have to, um, you know, at least move between spaces in a building, if not between buildings. Um, but I think that practices, good practices will, will develop because this is, this is something that is likely to continue, I think. So um, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's all up for grabs. And I think that, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, I think to sort of jump on a little bit in the conversation, um, home-based work is a skill. And I think it's a skill for the home-based worker. And I think it's a skill for the for the employer. And, and it's not something that we can do instantaneously. And I think everyone, everyone um, is learning. And that's a, a really, really important thing. And I think everyone has different ways of approaching it as well. Um, so... For me, it was really interesting because I've been working from home for a few years now. And what I found with COVID is that suddenly I've imposed 
incredibly tight discipline on my working hours. Whereas I used to, I used to allow my work to sort of permeate the rest of my life. And now I'm setting really tight boundaries round because I realized that um, in lockdown, I'm not able to take the sort of diversionary activities that I would otherwise do to break up the working day. So I wonder actually, that this is a really interesting question. How do we leave work? I mean, for those of us who were so used to physically walking out of the building and, okay, we didn't always fully leave it because we still had our phones, which we often checked. But it, when we work from home, how do we leave work at the end of the day? Yep. <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? How do we leave work? And I think that people do it in completely different ways. Um, and I think that for some people, they really don't know how to make that separation. And so they just they just close their computer and they're still sitting at the kitchen table. And that's probably quite unsatisfactory. And I think other people, people I've I've interviewed have actual uh, rituals. There's a pair of artists in 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 Wales who had a cottage next door to their studio and they would go out in the morning with um, their packed lunch and they go up the mountain at the back of their house and come down the mountain an hour's walk and go into the studio and they'd spend the whole day in the studio and have their lunch there. And then at the end of the day, they'd take the walk up the mountain again and come back home. And I've interviewed urban people who do the same thing. So the idea that you take a decent walk between the two activities. I've, I've, um, I, I've interviewed someone who um, would come down for breakfast in the morning in his leisure gear. And once he'd had breakfast... He'd go upstairs and put his suit on and then he'd come down in his suit. And uh, at the end of the day, he'd do the same thing. He'd take his suit off and he'd go. Everyone comes up with their own rituals, I think. But rituals at the end of the day, I think, are important. Yeah, I think I heard you talk about designing your commute to work. And yes, that's right. Exactly that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in terms of... Um, there's also sort of non-workplace rituals um, and informal performances of work, you know, and thinking of the post-work drink and these kind of um, activities that happen that are semi-workplace, um, semi-leisure, but where a lot of office dynamics are played out. Um, and I'm sort of wondering what's happening to this. Are there sort of secret Zooms where the pub goers go and have a, a little in-group in chat or are they not happening anymore is the landscape completely non-hierarchical i don't know is the answer to that question but i think that um that certainly people are organizing non-work catch-ups so people are having drinks at the end of the day they are having uh, coffees together so water cooler moments if you like and I think that the potential on Zoom is that this is um, more more inclusive, but obviously different workplaces have different cultures. And so, you know, I, I dare say in some in some workplaces, then there are exclusive Zooms being organised. But but I really don't know. I think this is something that we will we'll find out about as time goes on. And just to kind of wrap up our part of the discussion before we bring some questions in. Um, I wonder what you think the impact of this new work context is for architecture in the city. Mm. This is a huge question. This is a question that we could talk all day about. Um, and so the simple answer is, I think this is a paradigm shift. I think that um, we are now living our lives in a very different way and we're inhabiting the city in a very different way. And this is likely to have extremely wide ranging impact and i think it has the potential to um offer opportunities for for really imaginative responses from our designers um you know there are all sorts of challenges that are posed by working from home and my research shows that most of them can be solved through design and so I think uh, uh, potentially it's an extremely exciting time for our buildings and for our cities. And we have to wait and see what happens. In some ways, what I do think may happen is that it's a bit like the Industrial Revolution um, when new building types emerged. And I think it's possible 
that um, we will find that that new building types emerge. I think I think from my view, it'd be nice. I sort of at the beginning of lockdown started to see more of us walking and being in nature, and um, I, I would really like that to be part of our um, that l less of a mad rush actually. And if we could hold on to some of those more quiet moments, I think that would be that would be great. The productivity isn't just about rushing and spending longer hours, that it's about other things and, and that we might see that our environment and ecology can be more productive when we're a little bit less harried. So I hope we can set out some utopia versions. Um, we have some really great um, questions um, and I'm, I'm going to sort of do them in a slightly different order because I think there was something really nice about what you were talking about, um, the role of design and architecture. And there's a question here from Aidan Walker. What responsibility does the employer have towards the design of their employees' home working spaces? Mm, such an interesting question. Yes. What responsibility does they, do they have? Well, I think I think it's very it, I think this is a double edged question because um, uh, to what extent should health and safety get involved? To what extent should the home-based workplace be regulated? I think these are really difficult questions to answer. I think that the employer certainly has a responsibility to provide um, all the equipment that the, the um, employee uses and probably to pay a proportion of their bills. And I think that um, we've got British... British Telecom BT as a good case study here because they've been doing this for years. They've got something like 13,000 home-based workers and they have a whole, a whole um, great big package that arrives when somebody starts to work from home. And I think they do send somebody out to survey the scene um, uh, to make sure that it, there is appropriate space. Um, so, so I think it goes both ways because in some ways, if people have got less than ideal spaces, does that mean that they shouldn't be able to work from home? And I think that's quite a difficult ethical question because then um, if you say, yes, you should only work from home if you meet all the rules and regulations about health and safety, then potentially what you're doing is you're only allowing the more privileged to work from home who have better quality spaces. Although there's obviously a really clear argument for saying, this is the moment at which we need to really uh, pull our socks up in terms of our, our social housing and um, facilities for for um, the poor and the young, actually. Mm. I, think, I think that's great. I think there's slightly starting to answer a couple of the questions on there. And I think a good follow on from that is um, that there's a conflict uh, in our current condition um, in reality, we've been grappling with a global pandemic and trying to work from home. And uh, Maria Paez Gonzalez asked, um, would you agree that the optimism around working from home during this time is skewed and detrimental for long term decision making over the rights of workers? So I think that's kind of picking up a little bit on what you were saying. I think there's a, this really, really interesting in terms of the rights of workers, what's going on. Um, the Trade Union Council in the UK has um, traditionally been completely opposed to home-based work because they felt that it's very difficult to organise home-based workers and therefore to do the sort of collective um, negotiations in order to maintain good conditions of labour. However, um, the tra TUC in, in the UK has now, has now um, joined a campaign um, or has a campaign for the right to flexible working for everyone from day one of their job, only in jobs, obviously, where it's possible. I mean, you can't have a you can't have a, a street sweeper who works from home. But in jobs where it's feasible, um, there is a now a, a major campaign for the flexible right to work from home for everybody. And I think that um, so I think this indicates a big shift in employment uh, regulation and uh, organization. And I think that now, I suppose, the need to gather in a, a collective workplace in order to org to be part of an organizer, you know, or to, for labor to, oops, get my words out, for labor to organize is also reducing because so much can be done online. There's, there's a lot of, these questions are really great. They're really thoughtful. 
Um, I think there's one for, for us personally from Tom O'Dwyer. Did either of you personally have to overcome the issue of context collapse, um, in brackets, spatial separation, as our home and work lives have merged over the last few months? And what strategies have you observed to overcome this? So, I mean, for- I think that's one for you, Claudia, because I've been working at home for quite a while. So what do you think? Yeah, well, I think, um, so for me, obviously, I used to go and teach. So my work was very much based outside of my home. And then I'd have my one day of research at home, which was this kind of monastic existence of um, focus with my books. Um, That is no more. Working from home is no longer this kind of um, peaceful, reflective time. It's completely dominated by Zoom. Um, And they think, like I said, everything is a meeting. The, The technology has really changed Even interactions with students, you have to work really hard to try and break it out of that meeting face-to-face format. And I teach practice, which, yes, we have face-to-face dialogue, but we work with objects and physical things. Um, And that has been very complicated. I mean, one, one of the things that I have done is occasionally I just move my screen off center so that the focus is not on this kind of um, highly draining form of attention that you have to give to a face and you're trying to pick up all of these subtle clues. Um, so I've run drawing workshops where actually the camera's focused on the table um, and there's a really unusual sense of sharing a space because you hear sometimes um, you sort of reduce the, the interaction verbally and you gaze up and you look at someone drawing something and then you hear birdsong from someone else's apartment. And that's quite interesting because that actually felt like we were sharing a, a space um, or a context. So that was one strategy that I think has worked really well. But I think it's, it's, it's a, a big question. And um, I think if I, I was to pose a new poll, I'd sort of ask for other people's creative um, ways of breaking the making the zoom dominance um i think this one is actually a good one for you francis based on some of your reflections and your your um work with communities but also thinking um at the scale of the individual dwelling up to the scale of the block um Vali laliotti um has said how would you redesign the neighborhood for homework that's such a great question it's such a difficult question um, I think that I think that I think we're going to see huge changes to our cities. I was at a webinar the other day that had a traffic engineer explaining how they design roads around peak transport. Mm-hmm. And if lots of people are working from home, the peak transport and working flexibly which the two things you know tend to be part of the same conversation the peak transport drops quite radically and that means that um, schemes that are currently being being proposed for road widenings for for making um, roundabouts bigger for you know to enable a larger volume of traffic actually are just not necessary anymore and in fact potentially I think we could see a real reduction in car use. I haven't got any evidence for that apart from um, what this traffic engineer was saying. But this is just a sense that if, you know, there is this move to, um, there's there's a strong move from the C40 um, cities uh, to move to a 15-minute city. And the idea is that... um, a, a route, a good green route to um, COVID recovery is to, for, this, for cities to develop in neighbourhoods so that anyone can actually get to all the services they need within a 15-minute walk or a short bike ride. And I think once cities start to be organised in that way, um, they, will, they will transform. And, and quite how, I don't know. I mean, I know that home-based workers have to get out of the house and they have to change scene and they have to be able to meet each other. And I think we have to make a really clear distinction between 
home-based working and COVID lockdown. And so these two things are, are distinct. But, you know, if we look at the home-based workforce from the, for the last 20 years, um, there's a real need for people to find spaces where they can work. And so I think that, um, and also for them to be visible. One of the issues that people have is, is finding that, you know, when you go out to work, you get into your work clothes, you get onto public transport, you're part of a whole sort of stream of people moving to work, you arrive in a building, you're, you're, you're greeted as a person with a particular skill set. Whereas when you're a home based worker, um, there's a danger, nobody, that your, your whole occupational identity vanishes. And so I think that the, the I don't know how the, how the neighborhood will, um, how, the neighborhood will evolve but i think that um i think it will and i think the fact that we will all be in our or not all of us but the home-based workers will be in their neighborhoods much more will lead to um a, a stimulation of local social networks i think we can see that happening already and stimulation of the local economy and so potentially small businesses selling um uh i don't know let's see let's see it's going to be extremely interesting we're getting very close to the end of time um both francis and i have agreed that we would be happy to um respond to some of the questions we weren't able to address um by email later because there's some really great uh questions like um the home working phenomenon has led to greater productivity we might see the um a four day week as standard um changes to our social interactions because of this dependence on screen based work and a really um important question about you know we're talking a lot about uh home based work mediated by screen and um there's a lot of in people who don't have this technology at all um and i think francis on thursday you're doing another talk where you're going to talk a lot more about um inequality and those kind of issues that are much more based around the broader notion of home-based work. There's a question here, um, Claudia, that I, I'm longing to answer. Can we, can we go to it? Yeah. Pablo Alejos, if big offices don't make, doesn't make sense in this new future, what are we going to do with the skyscrapers we have in our cities? You know, I think this is an incredibly exciting possibility. Because um, what it what it makes me think is that we're in a moment where, um, like when light industry left the city and all the industrial buildings were left disused and and semi derelict, and then the artists moved in, and um, they moved in because they were non domestic spaces, the sort of non domestic spaces they wanted, they needed in order to work, and they developed really extraordinarily um, creative, interesting uh, neighborhoods of like-minded people who were doing some, some fairly extraordinary stuff. And I think that we could have, there is the potential for something similar to happen because at the moment we have this whole hidden uh, population of um, home-based workers who are the artists, who are the bakers, the brewers the furniture makers the costume makers the curtain makers who who like to live at their workplace and at the moment we don't have any any um formal place to accommodate them and so they tend to do it secretly in buildings um that aren't designed designed for that purpose so i think that that we could we could turn these buildings into uh, really, really interesting um, spaces for creative people to live and work in unconventional ways. So it's going to, I think it has the potential to offer unconventional living and working um, space. That's, that's, that's where I'm heading anyway. Francis, you rounded that up at exactly six o'clock. Um, ah! So I think I'm going to thank you very much for joining us for this really rich discussion. I think we can see an hour isn't enough. We need a sort of our own section, our, our own series on this. And um, thank you for the amazing <laughs> questions. And I, I would really like to spend some time going through those and responding to those by email. 
Um, so yes, thank you very much, Francis. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, thank you, Francis. Thank you, uh, Claudia, um, for sharing your thoughts and uh, expertise and insights. It was a very interesting conversation. And thank you to everyone who joined us for today's In Session Talk. If you have any additional questions or would like to connect directly with the executive education team and the speakers, please use the contact information on this slide. Uh, please follow us on social media at RCA Short Courses on Twitter and Instagram. And please make sure to check our event webpage for upcoming in-session talks and how to register for free. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time and uh, goodbye.